three principles of the text. Okay? And uh, uh, does any of oh, you know, it's on this handout if anybody has that on the page of like six or seven. It's a, it's a revelatory text from 15th century Tibet uh, from Manjushri, the Bodhisattva, to Tonkapa, giving the essence of the, of the basic path. It's called the Three Principles of the Path. And uh, it says, uh, I'll read it to you. Reverence to all the holy mentors. That means the guru. <laughs> I don't know why I like the word mentor. It's like a teacher, but a teacher plus a modeling thing. I will, explain, I will explain as best I can the key import of all the Victor's teaching. Victor is Jinnah, you know. And, and some people like to translate as conqueror, which I think is like overdoing the Conan, Conan <laughs> sort of aspect. <laughs> but Jinnah can't mean that. You know, the giant Jinnah, they have, the Buddha was called Jinnah which I call a victor, champion, you could say, teaching. Path praised by all the holy bodhisattvas. Best entry for those fortunate who seek freedom. Listen with clear minds, you lucky people, who aspire to the path that pleases Buddhas. Strive to give meaning to liberty and opportunity, and are not addicted to the pleasures of cyclic living. Living in the cycle. Lust for existence chains all bodied beings. Addiction to cyclic pleasures is only cured by transcendent renunciation. So first of all, seek transcendence. So those are just pre preliminary. Now the main verse is this one. Liberty and opportunity are hard to get, and there is no time to life. Keep thinking on this, and you will turn off your interest in this life. Contemplate the inexorability of evolutionary effects and the sufferings of life over and over again, and you will turn off interest in future lives. Okay. So, so these are... Oh, good. I have to please the mentors. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, this is the thing. What does it mean, liberty and opportunity? How many of you here are expecting to continue your yoga practice in the next life? Oh, I know, no hands, a show of hands. Not so many. Really. Next life, yes. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> expecting to. Well, you see, that you do expect to go to Mysore practice tomorrow morning. That's what I mean by expect. I don't really mean anything more magical or mysterious or like go to the psychic and find out. Anything like that about future life. I mean like where like you expect to go tomorrow morning. You don't know you're going to go to my sort of mind. You might die tonight. <laughs> Something might happen, but we might die. We might all be nuked. But you expect to go. Like, and it isn't a, you know, if someone asks you, do you believe in tomorrow morning? then you might, you wouldn't know what to do, whether to put up your hand or what. <laughs> do I believe in tomorrow? <laughs> you know what I expect there to be tomorrow, right? So that's a common sense thing in sane cultures, basically normal cultures, prior to the recent one in Western Europe and America and now on the planet, right? where everyone is only alive for this life, and they have an automatic exculpation for all the weird things they did and just by dying, right? Which is like, wow, permanent sleep, permanently unconscious, all the negative things I did not coming back to bite me. And, and then they pretend to be afraid of that. Huh. So liberty and opportunity are specific concepts in the Buddha's teaching. Having liberty means you're not born in hell. You're not born as a preta, hungry ghost. You're not born as an animal with no knowledge of language, who wouldn't be able to sit cross-legged in the lotus and work on your pelvic floor. <laughs> <laughs> Elephant can't even sit down. They can only roll in soft mud. They're heavy, too heavy. They're, they're ribcage flat. 
And uh, so you're not born any of those things. You're born a human. And among humans, you're not born, you're not an idiot. You're not, uh, you know, like, effective mentally. You're not a um, uh, slave. You're not in, the, in lifelong prison. You're not, like, in some sort of tribal thing with the, the every the war every day or something. At least not yet. <laughs> uh, you're, these are the, you're not a god in the pleasure realm with no time to focus because you're in your permanent jacuzzi, you think, which comes to an end and it's a great misery. Uh, you're not a titan who likes to fight all the time and attack the gods. So you're human and that's a leisure and then the, that's a liberty and then the opportunity that you have, and there's like, there's like eight kinds of liberties and there's ten kinds of opportunities having to do with your own abilities five of them, and five of them having to do with the presence in your world of li teaching of liberation. It doesn't have to be Buddhist teaching, it can be any kind of teaching that there's some sort of a thing called liberation, and uh, some sort of a possibility of evolving yourself to become something more than you may already be, or that you think you are. So that, those are the leisures and opportunities, and they're very hard to get, and Buddha, I think, almost exaggerated as a famous uh, simile where he said, there's an old blind turtle who lives in the ocean. And it's a really big turtle. It's bigger than that, but, but than that one might be really big. If the proportions change. And uh, it comes up for air every hundred years. And there's a golden yoke floating in the ocean that the king of Benares lost. It fell out of his chariot and it fell down the Ganga and it's in the ocean. And as frequently as that turtle will come up with his neck through the hole in the yoke, that frequently does a being rise from the lower forms of existence into the human form. Which I think is a little too scary. That's <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty long term. So, so in other words, what you have, the body that you have, the mind that you have is an incredibly precious thing. And then, if you if you know that, and furthermore, if you expect there to be another life, then you expect that you had previous lives, and then also you don't expect there was a first life, because that would have come from nothing. Your continuum came from your previous continuum forever, so you've had infinite previous lives. So then, um, you realize that in this one, you managed to become a human being. You sought that form. You thought a human being is really something great to be. Maybe you had been someone's pet, some sadistic dog owner's pet. He didn't only fed you every four days or like whatever, you know. And you had no ability to go and open the can yourself, you know. And, but you were a small pet and gentle, you didn't want to eat your owner. So, <laughs> so you know, you realize that the humans have some independent abilities and they can open cans if they can do things. So finally, you. You saw that weird looking human, male and female, in union, uh, getting it on on a Saturday night, and you decided, okay, when you were in the bardo, you were in the dog bardo, and you turned away from the handsome Doberman Pinscher couple, <laughs> or whatever, that you really much more admired, and you saw like weird thing with floppy limbs and like no hair and like couldn't run fast on four legs. You said, I'm going there because they can open cans. <laughs> and you became a human being. And then you were lucky enough to be in a world where the teaching of this one, so it's really difficult to find it. That's the idea. So the idea is now, now, now you should meditate on that, okay? Just meditate for two minutes on that fact. Meditate on feeling it like something, you know, you can clasp yourself, you know. You can do like the hara, like and the pelvic floor, like Richard was doing, that was so cool. I, mean, I sort of got into that. But I, I remember that from last year, it's so great. Anyway, touch yourself. This body you have is fantastic. You can't touch your brain, but you can put your hand on your head. You're amazing, and you have a brain all through your body. You have a heart brain, you have a throat brain, navel brain, gentle brain. You have like, you are amazing, amazing mechanism you are, biologically and spiritually. You, therefore, you're, you're, that you have that mechanism as a vehicle for an extraordinary consciousness that you have. It's 
It's incredibly, do you feel that you are truly precious? Now, you are all raised, we are all raised to go to school and science classes and the authorities nowadays are very much into how human being is only a material product. Consciousness is simply an illusion of the brain and therefore we are not very precious actually. We're an accidental random thing. We're going to be nothing when we die. Our life has no purpose and no meaning. And uh, they got rid of that with the they got rid of that with getting rid of the preachers and God and so forth in this modern post-Christian, post-Judaic culture. And so you don't really think you're precious unless you're a narcissist. You think that you think that's bad to think you're precious, but if you look at yourself as an ev evolutionary product that you yourself produce by climbing up the evolutionary possible forms of life over millions and uh, countless millions of lives, then you realize you're in a, you are really in a precious time yourself. When you realize that, you should, you know, so when you meditate on God, Okay, I'm a really precious thing. My, one moment of my consciousness, of my thought pattern, is incredibly valuable. It's hard-earned over evolutionary time. And therefore, and then I think back, how much of it have I wasted in my life? Just passing time. How much have I spent on things that, that don't actually necessarily enhance my being? That make me confident I'll have another embodiment as good as this in the future? Do I really know how to guide myself to the future? And this gives you, you get like really psyched up actually with the purpose of using this human embodiment, precious jewel as they call it, wish fulfilling gem of a human embodiment endowed with liberty and opportunity to using it to the full. But in order for you to really get psyched up about that, in all such meditations which are a little bit thoughtful and critical, not just emptying, you know, no thought meditations, you have to think of the alternative. You have to think of what you ordinarily and habitually do feel about yourself. You have to reflect on the culture that tells you that you're not valuable. That you are 85 cents of cheap chemicals running around in a bag of water. Which I've heard them say. Or maybe it's 15 cents. <laughs> I don't know what the Coke brothers are value. <laughs> the hydrogen and the different chemicals in the human system. Okay? So that's the first thing. But when it happens, then you feel that every minute is really precious. You want to turn it to practice. You want to turn it to performance. You want to turn it to evolutionary, what is evolutionarily appropriate. So then, and then you have to, of course, figure out what that is. Now, second thing, though, before that, though, second thing to reflect is there is no time to life. This is sort of like being in the moment, the second theme to meditate on. But actually what it is, it's a short form of meditation on death. So now please meditate on the fact that you're going to die. I apologize for making that request, but it's very important. At first you might think, of course I know I'm going to die, but I know that. Okay. But then reflect on whether you actually think you're going to die. Whether you are actually walking around in denial that you're going to by making plans for 10 years from now, one year from now, three years from now, 20 years from now, by sort of always just going ahead and not thinking about that transition that we know we will come to <coughs> on an intellectual plane. We have no visceral sense of it. So then to find out that time, life has no time, you go to the time when there is no more time in your mind, which is death. And you think about it. And then you know that thing you think about where, where they say people who have near-death experiences report or think they're going to die experiences report that they had an experience like their entire life flashing before their eyes in a split second. Like swoosh. The whole thing was just like a second. They sort of saw all of the detail. Actually. They remembered the whole thing, but it was such a rush. It felt like a split second. You know that one? So if that's so, if, if the moment of death is like that, then one is 
surely feeling that everything one did didn't matter much. And one of the regrets of time maybe maybe very well be that there were so many more things I wanted to do that I didn't do. And there are very few outstanding moments in that that made me pause when it flashed before me. And also when I get to that point, when I, which I definitely will, that point, because I definitely will die, that point to now, or now to that point, at that side will seem like a split second. Even if I live another decade, or two, or three, when I get there it will seem like a split second. So, in a way, that moment, I'm certain of that, and that's the first thing. Second thing to find out about no time is, I don't know when that will be. Could be tomorrow, could be tonight, could be ten years from now. There will be no certainty. And then in this second root meditation of the no time, you think about how older people outlive younger people, sadly, sometimes. Healthy people die before sick people, sometimes. People in a safe, seemingly safe place like a movie theater or health clinic sometimes die before people in a war zone. There's no guarantee about it, no certainty. So it could be any time. So then you're beginning to come into the true moment where every moment could be your last in a way. You, you see how intense that will be, and particularly when it's built on, you're having become very strongly convinced about your own preciousness, and the preciousness of the particular configuration of body and mind that you have now. When you're such a precious consciousness and embodiment, you are, and it will definitely, you will lose it, and that you don't know when, then that combined makes you very, very alert mindful, focused. And then, you think about what is it when you say you will leave this body and mind behind, what will you be that leaves it behind? In other words, what goes on? And this again is kind of mysterious, I think, to materialists, to us conditioned, acculturated materialists. I'm not saying we still are necessarily, but we are acculturated like that. It's kind of a mystery what goes on. But to Buddhists it's very simple, and mostly Hindu, most Hindus, most, most uh, Taoists, most people who have been influenced by the Buddhist science, let's call it, enlightened science, so that's to make it sound like religion. And that is, a super subtle mind goes in a super subtle body, which is like a dream body, like when you have a dream and you're going around doing things, you have eyes that see things in a dream, you have ears that hear things in a dream, so that you must have some sort of a virtual reality body there, although normally we don't pay attention to it, it's like a point of awareness in a dream, but we do have some kind of a body, logically speaking, we can become aware of what kind of body we have in a dream. So it's a body like that, that the super subtle mind goes in. So where is the super subtle mind? Super subtle mind is in the heart center, very deep. As far as the Buddhist science says, this is not just the subtle mind, it's the super subtle mind. It's very deep in the mind, in the, in the heart center. And uh, it is sort of aware of the clear light of the void. It is aware of the of Satchitananda, it is actually aware of, etc. Deep down in there, somewhere in the middle of the heart. And Brahmahood. But, the, but the, the part of the super subtle mind that is still not fully aware of its union with all Buddhas and Brahmas is sitting at the threshold of that and it has greater or lesser degrees of openness. And the greater openness comes from things like habits and practices and performance of generosity of altruistic ethicality, of altruistic patience and tolerance and non-anger, of creativity for both self and others, of concentrated concentration, mental ability to focus the mind, and of wisdom, which is the knowledge of 
connectedness to the world, knowledge of relativity, openness to, to the relationality of self to the world. All of those things develop openness in that super subtle mind. It plants a gen genetic code, you could say, a DNA for openness. And so, so therefore, that super subtle mind will go toward forms of life that are more open. It will admire and like and be attracted to, even if it's not consciously able to aim itself to a particular womb, if it's to be reborn as a mammal, or a particular heavenly plane, if it's to be reborn in a heaven. But there's some dharma, there's some yoga practitioner heavens where they have permanent, permanent, <laughs> permanent pelvic floor practice. <laughs> 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 They don't have to eat and drink, and they don't bother with it. You know? And they're all hermaphrodites, so they don't have to go out and finding a date on Saturday night. <laughs> and they're really great yogi, yogi, yogi needs. And uh, so someone might go there, for example. But since one has, if one doesn't have that, at least one will, that super subtle mind will be more open in the bardo, and thereby able to guarantee a positive thing. So the focus of one's life. When one is aware of the preciousness of oneself, one's life, and one's human body, mind, life, and one is aware that there's no time to it, you can't just sort of postpone things that are key to appreciate, to using meaningfully that precious body, mind, then all of one's effort focuses on things that will enhance that super subtle body, mind to go forward, you know, in the virtual reality after death toward a greater and greater life. And so then it says you will lose interest in this life. And what that means doesn't mean that you won't be interested in this life, actually. It just means an excessive preoccupation, preoccupation I should translate. You give up preoccupation with just whatever you're going to get out of this life. Still, you want to take care of this life, of course, because it's precious. But you're looking for a longer trajectory. You're living in a longer planning mode. You have a longer space and time to develop it. So you're living in a bigger, bigger setting. Okay? So that's that. But then what people will do is they will get into, well, yeah, in the future of this, this life, I couldn't be a great yogi. I couldn't practice much. I didn't get very enlightened. I didn't go on a long retreat. I didn't meditate. I didn't really learn. I didn't memorize the Heart Sutra, whatever, or the Yoga Sutra, or whatever it was I want to memorize, you know, punish on. But next life, I'll do that. So then, this, the next verse says, the next line in that verse said, contemplate the inexorability of evolutionary effects and the sufferings of life over and over again. And then you'll turn off preoccupation of future lives. And uh, or interest in future lives. So what that means is, you can't count on those things either. So now, what does it mean by the inexorability of the cause and effect of evolutionary action? This means karma, causation. Buddha was a great scientist, and his main celebration, he was celebrated, of course, for his discovery of nirvana, but also for his discovery of causation. Because the human discovery of causation freed the humans from the gods, from the whim of the gods, and enabled the humans to think about improving their situation in a practical manner, and, and, and enabled them to rise above thinking that everything was controlled by the gods at least the humans who want to be realistic. Not that gods are not existing, they are. Not that they're not powerful and can cause trouble and cause benefit. They do, both directions. But just they're not in total control of things. There's a causation that is in control of what's Buddha's discovery. So then they, they begin the celebratory verse about Buddha that's lasted for thousands of years. Om ye dharma hetu prabhava. You know that he is, that things arise from causes and what are their causes? So that great seeker, he gave the teaching about, about that. So, so, uh, so now what is the inexorability of cause and effect? What that is, is it relates to the idea that you can become enlightened. You can become Satchitananda. I think, that, I hope that's what you're trying to do. If you're in the Hindu framework, if you're in Buddhist framework, if you want to attain nirvana, non-dual, Buddhahood. 
in the form of non-dual Buddhahood. Some Buddhists want to just attain nirvana as arhatship, uh, but then they want to, when they, once they get that, they want to go on to Buddhahood, of course, because Buddhas have a lot more fun and are more useful in the world than just saints. You know. So, if you're seeking that, what that is, is a, is a state of being, a mode of being where you, you are still the continuum of your previous individual being, but you also feel, experience, concretely experience, a non-dual oneness with everything. So, and that is said, that is said to be such an ananda by the Vedantic Hindus, and it is said to be with such being awareness bliss. That means such an ananda, and by the Buddhists it's said to be detong yermepa, bliss void indivisible. So there seems to be agreement on that point. That it's like more cheery than what's going on normally. Except at Menla. <laughs> and uh, so, if that's the best possible mode of existence, to be enlightened in that way, divine, enlightened, or whatever you want to call it, then the worst possible one, the opposite of that, feeling one with all beings, is feeling completely isolated and separated from all beings. Being so frightened and paranoid and disgusted with everything that you shrink up into like, hide yourself in a little iron bowl, which becomes a prison, but you feel safe inside the prison, of course. And anyway, that's a description of hell. Kind of hell, it's described like that. Like an iron house with no doors and windows, where you're crushed in there. But no one can reach you. No one can bother you. You're so disconnected from so alienated. You know. So, if those are the two extremes, then there are said to be ten skillful ways of acting in the world, causally speaking. Ten skillful ways of acting that all of which lead to greater openness. And although it may be in small increments, those evolutionary actions therefore will plant a seed for greater openness in the super subtle body mind, your soul DNA, your soul gene. Right? And that is, for example, there are three physical ones when you're having a physical body, not that's only human. And that is the positive skillful action is to save other beings' lives, cherish them and save them. And the negative one is take other beings' lives, kill them, and therefore sever yourself from their continuum of existence. You don't really destroy them. You can't destroy anyone because they are reborn. But you destroy their possession and their inhabiting of their body, and, and that's a very sad thing for them, usually. And they don't like that. And then the point is, in your own evolution, it is closing yourself off from that one being by saying that their life has nothing to do with me and I can just deprive them of it, right? So that's the first unskillful and skillful. The unskillful one then is measured by how much it closes you off and alienates you from other life. And the skillful one is how much it opens you up. Because when you save another life, somehow you associate with it, it's me, it's, part, it's my first step in considering it's part of my life. You know, they have in cultures this thing when you save someone's life, they, they, you sort of adopt them, and when, and when you, and they sort of adopt you because you saved their lives, so you somehow join your lives when you save them. They have all kind of different cultures that have things like that. And, and that's kind of an expression of that, which we can see by common sense. Second one is to take other people's possessions, take, literally take what is not given to you, and, um, which makes it a little sharper definition. And the opposite of that is giving to others, being detached from your own position and sharing them with others. Again, opening you versus closing you off from the lives of from the universe, right? And the third one is to use sexuality in a harmful way. Most generally speaking, sometimes people think it's just adultery or things like that, but it is not. It is uh, it is using it har harmfully, which is particularly poignant actually because. Of course, sexuality is when the highly evolved being called a human and, and other highly evolved beings relative to others called mammals, when the two uh, genders melt together to whatever degree they're capable of. 
So it is where there is, this, there is a biological drive for expansion, for joining with another, for being identifying with another, expanding the sense of identity, identifying with the beloved. So to use that biological moment in one's life to be harmful to another, that is to intensify one's separation from them, is highly unskillful. And harmful can be destroying a family through adultery, it can be you know, rape and whatever, all different kinds of, uh, of sexual abuse that are dished out, right? So those are the three physical, and, they, and you can see clearly how one type is skillful that leads toward Buddhahood or Brahmahood, one type leads to hell, alienated hell, right? Then speech is the second major causal way, you know, level of, of, of evolutionary action of karma, because speech, and speech is very powerful actually, because it's the level of mantra, and it's also the level where you and other minds join, you by listening to them, them by listening to you. So if you lie to another being unskillfully, you separate yourself from them again, you separate them from reality by creating a false reality for them, and which is harmful to them, and you, uh, you, you intensify your sense of separateness, right? You speak the truth to them, you sort of open your awareness to them, whether you know what, whether, you, whether it really is true or not, you don't know, but whatever you think is the truth you share, that way you share your world with them, you invite them into your world. So that's expanding, right? You speak to others in a way to cause conflict between them, divisively, um, backbiting, sometimes people translate it, that, that's a big enough for that definition, versus that's skillful, because you're expanding the benevolent, positive interaction of people by making them friendly with each other, peaceful with each other, whereas when you speak divisively to cause them to be enemies with each other, you're alienating yourself from both of them, actually, although you might do it thinking that if I tell so-and-so that the other person hates them and they're horrible and so on, maybe they'll be my good friend. But actually, you're being harmful to both of them. So that's divisive speech versus diplomatic and peacemaking speech. Right? Close off and expand. Then there's harsh speech versus sweet speech. That's obvious. Harsh speech drives people away, sweet, and you from them and them from you. Sweet speech attracts them. And then there's meaningful speech where you live up to the privilege of occupying their minds to the extent that they're listening to you, that you don't speak meaninglessly to them and just waste their mental space, but you speak about the Dharma, about reality, about enlightenment, about positive evolution, about whatever might be a benefit to them and meaningful to them. Right? So those are the four speech things, skillful and unskillful. And then the three mental ones are parallel to the three physical ones. There's Hateful, hating mind, or malevolent mind, or malicious mind, which wants to get rid of other beings, wants to harm, harm them, and therefore separate you from them. So thinking like that is a powerful evolutionary act. And, uh, and then uh, versus loving mind, that uh, wants only peace and happiness for them. And uh, those are, mind ones are even more powerful, almost, than physical ones, because they the mind is closer to that super subtle place where the habits, the mental habits are engraved in the form of the equivalent of like a DNA code, a code for openness or a code for closeness. Right? So then you have a greedy mind, you know, jealous, envious, covetous mind that wants other people's stuff, you know, versus a generous mind that is detached and delights in them having their stuff and their success. And rejoices in their happiness and so forth. So that's the second one. And then the third one is the negative one, the positive one is having a realistic worldview, meaning wise worldview, meaning open to what is reality. And the opposite of that is having some kind of completely unrealistic, senseless conviction, closed-mindedness, only some fanatic thing, it's only this way or that way, which is completely not against common sense. Like the idea that I'm really nothing, which is what is driving the modern industrial culture off a cliff and destroying the planet. It's the idea that we're all really nothing, so it doesn't matter. So we can just carry on however many centigrade it is. So those are the, so those. Now, when we look at those in this context, 
You look at those 10 pounds, and then you think of how much killing goes on. Digesting food, you kill all kinds of micro beings in your microbiome, even your best vegetarian. Growing vegetables, you, the, the plows run over insect, insects and things. And um, driving on the road, you run over all kinds of bugs and insects, insects and whatever. And a lot of killing does go on. It's very hard now to do it, which is all more cutting ourselves off from life, you know, narrowing our sense of, of expanded identity. And, um, you know, what is truly given to us and that, we, that we take, do we, do we, is there, is it, we sometimes take things that weren't really given to us, you know, in, in some broad sense, you know, what, what we own, you know, what are we, right? Do a title search on any piece of property in the United States. Where was it taken without being given? And um, so it's very difficult in other words to avoid the unskillful, the unvirtuous, negative evolutionary acts. And so, so we have to be really, really alert about it. And so we don't know what we might do spontaneously in a future life. So we don't just count on, on positive evolution in a way. Some, at some remote time. And then finally, the f fourth theme that we think about is we think about what it's like to be an alienated person. Buddha, the first noble truth of Buddha taught was the suffering of the unenlightened life form. That it was inevitable suffering. Even some relief or pleasure of an unenlightened being is called the suffering of, hap the, uh, the suffering of change. Because that happiness, that relief, never lasts. It's never sufficient, it's never enough. The suffering of suffering is obvious to us, it's suffering. And then there's something called the suffering of creation, which is sort of the cosmic thing, even you're in a high meditative state, you know, because you become an adept meditator, great yogi, if it's still a relative state, that you enter through some causal process, it's still a created state, even if it seems like a vast, wonderful state. You created it through causes, you come back down out of it through causes, and therefore it's, a, it's not really the Satchit Ananda of Brahmahood, or definitely not Nirvana, because it's a relative state. It's not the absolute, in other words. Not absolutely a lot. So all forms of self-centered existence, which, mean, which is what unenlightened existence means, it's the existence of you as different from the universe, really different. I'm really me, and you are all really you, and the universe is all you, the universe, and the, the Isis, and the Syrians, and the lunatics are dictators, the mass murderers, they're not me. But that's an unworkable situation, ultimately, because there's a lot more of them than me. And, then, and death and sickness and old age and all comes and gets you. Anyway, you focus on those four things and you develop what's called the mind of transcendence. And what the mind of transcendence is, or transcendent renunciation, and what that mind is, is not at all some sort of self martyring, self flagellating, self deprivation, some self denial thing. Actually, it's self compassion. Why is that? Inventory how you spend your time in your life. Now you all are particularly wonderful people because you're here for Buddha and the yogis. You're here to do yoga with Richard. You're here to look into the meaning of life. And, but probably a lot of the time you are not. You have to work, you have jobs, you have families, you have you know, professions, you have like, causes. You do a lot of things just for livelihood, just for, you know, enhancement of this life, just for your family's enhancement in this life, again. And so you don't stop doing those with transcendent renunciation, but you shift your priority. You, they, they move to a lesser priority than what you're doing for spiritual purpose and what you're doing for evolutionary purpose. And even like, say, with your family, like, like what my old teacher, my old teacher used to say, what mom, what mom on this world holds their baby in their arms 
and says to that baby, I want you to be a Buddha. <laughs> I want you to become a Brahma, one with Brahma. Tatramazi. Babe, okay, have some milk from my breast, but by the way, Tatramazi. <laughs> Which mom does that? Actually, he was pleased because his Mongolian mother did do that. She told her, like, you, you got to bow down, you need to be a Buddha, do a prostration. She wasn't a yoga teacher, but she taught the yoga of, of Namaskara you know, to him when he was a little boy. But normally what they say, they say, I want you to be a movie star, I want you to be president, I want you to be a concert violinist, whatever, you know. They have their ambitions for their children. And someone with transcendent renunciation would not kiss their children or their family, but whatever only helps them in a worldly way, that would be a lower priority than what might help them spiritually. Even, the, even out, because altruistically, once you feel better having a higher purpose in your being as your main priority, then you realize that it makes everyone feel better to do that. That that is truly giving, being compassionate to yourself you know, preempting, precluding various kinds of future suffering for yourself by being spiritually healthy, let's say, seeking spiritual wholesomeness, seeking liberation, being free and blissful. That's what transcended. And then, and then you immediately, when you feel transcended, you know, remember Don Juan? You know, Carlos Castaneda, Don Juan? He used to talk about the warriors abandoned. He, I, lo I love that. He, he didn't say abandonment, he said abandon. You know, like we have a thing like so-and-so did such and such with a great abandon, you know. It means like they were really, you know, they did a quadruple access with great abandon. In other words, they were so confident and ecstatic about it that they twirled and landed perfectly, you know, without even thinking about it, you know. So abandon thing is like that. You know, transcendent renunciation is like that. Where you do, you do all the worldly things, but you have, you know that you're doing it in such a way <coughs> as to be a higher thing. Like, for example, there was a famous monk uh, in the Buddha's time, in his early Sangha, mendicant in his early Sangha, who was incredibly stupid. His brother was already an arhat, you know, and that is to say, had a kind of temporary, you know, personal nirvana, and, and was uh, highly, you know, learned, you know, admired in the community. But the other one was couldn't remember a single sentence, single four-line verse. Didn't know, couldn't remember anything. So they took him to Buddha, like, what can we do with this guy? He's a sincere, he wants to be a mendicant, he wants to be enlightened, but he can't do that. So Buddha said, okay, I tell you what, you sweep the floor, right, you, know, you make that your yoga, but when you, as you sweep, you say, out dust, out defilements. Out dust, out negative thoughts, you know, like addictions, you know, kleshas, you know, whatever we want to translate that. Out addictions, addictive mentalities, emotions, and ideas. So that's what he did, and, and he became an arhat. So he didn't have to learn all kind of complicated things. He became an arhat. So that was combining an ordinary activity, sweeping, with cleansing his soul, you know, cleansing his mind. Okay? Then, once you get, uh, what is I want to do all basics today, I have six, seven more minutes. Once you get that transcendence, which is most important, and remember within getting that transcendence, you get to where you expect to have the next life. So you're suddenly in a different plan, you're not just planning your retirement, you're planning your retirement and then your next round. <laughs> and also you're aware of all your past ones. So, and not only that, remember Buddha under the tree? Everyone knows the story, but do you remember? Before he attained Nirvana, what did he, what happened to him? He had three, on that night, he had three realizations. They owed all the stories say. And what were they? The first one was he remembered infinite previous lives of his own. So people who say Buddha didn't need former and future life are like not telling you the facts, at least according to the Buddha. He remembered infinite previous lives. Wow, I was all, you know, meaning that he, since they're infinite, he had been every single kind of being, conceivable kind of being, including every, you know, like weird sci-fi thing you see on Star Trek, and more. He had been every single one of them. 
And then second one was where he, he remembered all, the, he became aware of all the previous lives of every other being. Every single other being. Now think about that. Like, they all had infinite lives. So he remembered all of them. And what they don't emphasize in the Theravada version of that is that once you, once you have two such experiences, visceral experiences where you feel, you remember how you interacted infinitely with everybody infinite else, then you have to have compassion for them because they were your mothers. You know, you were related to them in every way. Of course, they were your enemies too. They were your, they were your predators and whatever. And we've all been everything. But that, what's the point of dwelling on that? They were our mothers, every single being. So, so then, so then that forced him to attain their love. That's all that, where he was everybody else's mother. And all that work, all that unpaid labor, Nirvana's the only option. So then third thing, he attained Nirvana. And my theory is that the reason he remembered all those previous lives, and specifically at that time, is because he was on the event horizon of Nirvana. And therefore, he realized he'd always been in Nirvana. So he could remember those previous lives without all the suffering of those previous lives. He suddenly revised his experience where he had been suffering. And then he realized actually he was implicit at that time already. Because Nirvana has to have always been here. Brahmahood has to have always been here. Satchitana. It's here right now. It's just we're too stupid to know. We're too self-centered and too narrow in our view. By, but, let, but that narrow view of ours is ignorant view. Luckily, it isn't effectual. It isn't accurate. It's a loser. The real thing is, everything is great right now. <laughs> anyway, and okay, so then the reason I'm bringing that up is once you feel better with your transcendence, then you feel compassionate for everybody. And furthermore, the Bodhisattva vow that all of your future yoga, all of your future existence is for the benefit of everybody else becomes not a big heroic thing, it becomes self defense. Why? I want everybody else to be happy because I'm going to be in the same space with them karmically forever and I don't want them bugging me. <laughs> <laughs> and if they're all happy, they'll be fine. There'll be no, one with it. no one will think I'm in the way of their happiness. But they need to use me for their happiness because they'll already be happy. So it's totally self-defense. So I, we can all enjoy our nirvana together. So that's the Bodhisattva vow. Very, very important. Which makes you feel even way better. Surprisingly, they say even when you sleep, if you take what is up about, if you vow to live for all beings, which does not exclude yourself, it doesn't mean you be a martyr for them all, it means you live for them as well as you, equally to you. If you live that way, apparently, that makes you feel even better. Because I guess it's so impossible to get anything done quickly. It gives you a little, little stamina. And then finally, third, selflessness. And don't say it's just a Buddhist thing. And then you, because you, like, if you're Hindu and we like to be, have Atman, but I don't have Atman, that's all done. That's all done. The Karma Atma that you have is not your narrow, small personality on your driver's license, on your social security card. Right? The Yajnavalkya told Indra, or somebody did, Uma did, they told them, like, you are not this, not this, not this, not this, not this, not this. Not this. All those things are. An atma. The atma is Brahma Satchitananda. Yeah, fine. The Buddhists simply say the supreme self of selflessness. So it really amounts to the same. Same Satchitananda. Or as sometimes I jokingly say, Snachananda. <laughs> <laughs> okay? The same Snachananda. And, uh, and that, therefore, you have to understand your selflessness. And the way that you understand your selflessness is, and I'm going to come back to these four verses, but just quickly, is you look for yourself. Really look hard for yourself. Which means that, and you know you feel you have one. If someone comes and accidentally kicks you, steps on your toe, it's like, you know, what are you doing to me? And this thing comes out of the solar plexus. And hopefully it bounces off the pelvic floor. <laughs> then it makes you feel like choked that this person did this terrible thing. And you feel like full of yourself, having been abused in some way, being 
trespass the harm. You feel mistreated, not, not this, not that. So that's the self, okay? It's see, and then when you're in the, when the grip of a strong emotion, really angry, really like obsessed with getting something, really confused and depressed and turned it on yourself, when you have a really powerful emotion, that emotion feels like you can't not be its tool. You can't not totally go with that emotion. If it's anger, you just run at a wall. You just pound somebody. You hurt somebody you like. You break something you value. You can't stop it because it seems to come from an absolute source. And your mind says, I hate that. Oh, I want that. Oh, I can't have that. Oh, I am so terrible. The world is all. It's when, that, when you get into that, it's because the I that says that seems completely compelling to you, like inevitable, you can't not listen to it. So looking for yourself means first you acknowledge the sense of such a self inside, visceral sense, even though logically you might say, yes, sure, I know every atom, every subatomic particle in me has pure relationality, I know that, my mind is purely, my spirit is purely relationality, but still there's that feeling. And look for what it is that feels that, that you feel there. And if you do, both the Upanishadic sages and the Buddha tell you, you will not find anything. You will fail to find it. And, but they're always open for someone to succeed. If you find it, and you're determined about it, and that's me, that's me, that's absolute. Send Nagarjuna a telegram. <laughs> Buddha, any of them. And you punish out and say, send them a telegram. They all screwed up. I, I got my real self. <coughs> and, uh, and then, you, of course, you have to prove it's not your relative self, which is the only one you can actually possess, which you do possess, of course. And both sides agree that you do. It's your relative one that realizes your absolute lack of one, and which therefore enjoys your paramatma, and enjoys your satchitananda, and enjoys your nirvana, this void indivisible. Okay? So those are the basics, the, the three principles. Transcendent renunciation, or transcendence, or transcendent abandon. Universal compassion for yourself and all beings. And the wisdom of selflessness. Okay? And if you have those three, then you can be a great yogi. Definitely. And then we can talk about tantra, which is what we usually do at some stage. We have done in the past, either Shaiva or Buddha. Okay? Ding! <laughs>